Thank you very much, uh, Jens Peter, for the invitation. I'm Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to give a broad overview to our research, so uh, not too much about new work, but I'll be happy to discuss our unpublished uh, data in the, in the discussion at the end. I'm going to start by showing this quote because I, I really like it, and I think it kind of encapsulates what we are all trying to do as academics or researchers, leave our fields in a better state than they were when we found them. But I gave this talk to a group in Germany a couple of weeks ago, and when I showed this quote, um, um, all the professors started to laugh, <laughs> which made me think maybe it's more difficult than, than I imagine. Um, essentially, the, the biggest challenge, I think, in, in research and um, research policy is how to best balance research quality and quantity. And this is shown in a figure from a review by Edwards and Roy in 2017 that I really like was actually their quote about improving one's field that I started the talk with. So there is this kind of magic point at which we optimize scientific productivity where we have a perfect balance between quality of output and quantity. Of course, we need some emphasis upon quantity, otherwise nothing will ever get done. But if there's too much emphasis upon quality, then we will um, reduce productivity because of you know, reduced desire or appetite for taking risks. Probably most of the time we're on the right hand side of this curve because in most systems there's likely to be an overemphasis upon quantity. And if you have any doubts about that, there's a few bits of data that indicate that uh, we are um, basically producing more and more science over time. So this slide shows um, an exponential rate of publication growth from the 60s to about now, and many publications show the same data. But we can contrast this with the rate of research funding, the rate of growth, which is essentially about the same. So it's roughly the rate of inflation again from the 50s to the present day. So we're not really seeing any meaningful increases in funding, but lots of productivity. So if we have a demand for growth, static or declining research funding, essentially this can create a raft of perverse incentives with unintended consequences. So Edwards and Roy show this curve as possibly careering towards the bottom where essentially we do not have any true scientific productivity and we have a total dislocation between the scientific and career value of publications. And you might think that this is something that could never happen, but this is the territory in which paper mills thrive essentially. So a couple of years ago, I probably would have had to spend a lot of time talking about what paper mills are, but I think there's much greater awareness of paper mills today. I've shown in this diagram, there's a kind of a shadowy area and that's to indicate the stakeholders that are inside the paper milling ecosystem that know that they're in there, they know that they're probably doing something that's not right. Um, and there are people though that engage with paper mills that are probably still unaware of really what's going on. So the paper mill is shown at the top and its job is to support research, but in a way that is not declared and therefore is not transparent. So clearly paper mills can do this in many ways, but uh, most commentators talk about paper mills as likely um, fabricating data, possibly fabricating entire manuscripts. So the paper mill takes care of the manuscripts, but manuscripts require two things. They require authors and they require journals. So uh, researchers who are under extreme pressure to publish can provide um, themselves as authors. And then um, the manuscripts need to find homes in various kinds of journals. Of course, well, what's the advantage for a journal in publishing manuscripts? Essentially, uh, they can benefit through publication fees and of course, they can benefit from future citations and specialty journals have always got a very close eye on their citations because that determines the impact factor. So we think that there are probably journals that are inside and outside of this um, ecosystem. Some journals probably know what they're doing, some journals probably don't. So the publications from the journals then generate some benefits to institutions in terms of publication metrics, future funding, and the institutions help to turn this wheel by imposing publication quotas on researchers and by offering career rewards for publications and sometimes cash rewards as well. And those cash rewards can actually 
pay the paper mills. And so this, this wheel kind of turns. One of the key factors is oversupply. So too many researchers for too few positions, um, too many institutions that have aspirations to do research when that is not their core business or they're not actually enabled to do research. And too many journals who are trying to compete for, uh, for manuscripts that are actually extremely difficult and expensive to produce and therefore are probably not in the quantities that the journals require. I think about paper mills in terms of their effects on these three groups, essentially the institutions and funding bodies that support research, the publishers and the journals that create the papers and the research community that produces the data. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on the research community today because that's my own perspective. So as a researcher, I started out studying um, cortical plasticity, so plasticity of the brain in response to injury. And I fairly quickly switched over to study cancer predisposition and molecular genetics of cancer, which is what I did for my PhD. And I've really returned to that over a long period in my career. As a postdoc, I started to identify genes and tried to work out what they were doing. And I also did that for a long time. And then I started to study the operations of cancer biobanks because I'd also been involved in biobanking throughout my cancer research career. And it was really the combination of all of this that led me to the research integrity work that we've been doing for some time. So I'm someone that studies genes and they are very important to me and I'm going to try and explain why, they, why they're important to everybody. So again, perhaps thanks to the pandemic, people are more molecular literate than they were a couple of years ago. So most people have heard of DNA and even RNA. So human cells use this molecule DNA as an instruction manual that encodes all the instructions that we need to build an organism such as a human. And these instructions are written in just four letters, A, C, G, and T. And it's the order of those letters that convey the information. So we all have three billion nucleotides in the same order in every cell. And we actually have two copies of those nucleotides, one from each parent. That's the genome. And the genome is divided into these functional units called genes. So the information in genes is written in this nucleotide sequence. And because we only have four letters, there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of redundancy and it's essentially impossible for a human eye to read the information that's in a sequence such as I've shown. So even somebody like me who's been staring at DNA for 30 years, I, can, I cannot read that. So we have approximately 40,000 genes and most of them are poorly studied for a variety of reasons. Um, we have genes that make RNA as their final product and we have genes that make RNA as an intermediary and protein as a final product. But all of these genes, um, not all of them, but you know, probably about 90% of them are really quite poorly understood. I cloned a couple of members of a particular gene family in the 90s, and one of those genes I was fairly disinterested in, I would say, because there was no real, really good evidence that it was involved in cancer, so I didn't study it very much. I was very surprised then in 2015 when I realized that groups of researchers were studying this gene in a very similar way in different cancer types. And so we found, initially we found five papers studying the same gene in different cancer types. Um, they showed some very striking similarities such as very, very similarly formatted uh, figures. So this is a figure from one paper, the same figure from another paper. And I knew from supervising PhD students that if you give data to different groups of people, they produce figures that look completely different because there's essentially no reason to produce identical figures. There's just so many ways that you can represent the data. So I found these figures very strange. But we became more concerned when we started to look at the nucleotide sequences described in these papers. This paper here is the paper that was looking at liver cancer. So it's describing two sequences and those sequences are linked to two identifiers. And in the experiment, you can see that the control, the negative control is essentially not doing anything, which is what it should be doing. And then the targeting reagent is interfering with the gene, which again is what it should be doing. That's all very well, um, except that when we take these non-targeting controls and we do very basic bioinformatics, we realize that they have the features of targeting reagents. And so in this paper, what is actually meant to be two sequences is the same sequence. It's just called two different things. And so it can't actually two, do two different things in an experiment. So this paper has been retracted. So Sarah Lambert, who's here today, and myself, we've published 48 examples of these papers in Scientometrics in early 2017. We found that all of these papers were 
paper is describing this technique called gene knockdown in human cancer cell lines, looking at different genes. We proposed at the time that we might be looking at a, a bigger problem, um, perhaps fraudulent or fabricated papers, claiming to examine understudied genes in human cancer models where content might be created using templates, which might explain the very striking similarities between these papers. And if these papers were being put together very quickly, um, this might be associated with higher error rates than you would see in the kinds of papers that um, myself and my colleagues were trying to publish around the same time. In 2019, we put some more detail to this kind of model by proposing that paper mills might be selecting single genes, producing these manuscripts in different cancer types. There might be ways of identifying these manuscripts. There would almost certainly be ways for paper mills to attempt to evade detection because that would be important. In 2020, um, myself and Jana Christopher published this paper in Fab's Letters, which was kind of a bit of a how-to guide of, for journals and peer reviewers to detect manuscripts and publications from paper mills. And we've essentially been elaborating on this model where paper mills will benefit from having many topics to exploit and human genes serve that purpose because we have, um, yeah, we have 40,000 of them and they can be studied in many different ways. There are many, many journals that will publish this kind of fairly simple gene research, cancer journals, et cetera. The very large interdisciplinary journals will do this. Um, they can be distributed across many authors uh, in response to widely applied publication quotas. There are different author groups that can plausibly publish this kind of gene research. And this can all go on for a long time if there's a supply and demand, if papers aren't detected, and if we choose not to act. So detection of papers requires skill, but doing something about them requires will, and those are kind of quite different things. The nucleotide sequence reagents themselves provide us with a capacity to screen for these papers. They are, as I've mentioned, the nucleotide sequences can't be read by eye, so mistakes in these sequences can't be detected visually. And yet because of the need to link the sequence with an identifier, these reagents become verifiable. So they are really quite useful screening targets because firstly, Something that matters to me a lot as a molecular person is that they are real objects in the real world. You can order a sequence, you can pay for it, you can come to your lab, you can add water, and you can start doing experiments. So they're real things. They're verifiable, as I mentioned, in terms of screening. Um, sensitivity can be conferred by having multiple sequence reagents per paper. The kinds of papers that we're screening at the moment can have up to 200 sequences per paper. There are different error types that can affect these sequences, and they're all hidden to the human eye. And the techniques that rely on these reagents are very widely described within the literature. So some of the major techniques have all won Nobel Prizes for either chemistry or medicine. They're designed to be reused in different studies. And because they're so widely used and understood, there's lots of people who can verify these kinds of sequence errors. The three main sequence error types that we have, I guess, identified and study are Reagents that are claimed to target a gene, but actually target something different. So they target a gene, just the wrong one. Um, the second most common error is the bottom one here, where we have something that's claimed to target a gene, doesn't seem to target anything at all. And then we have the opposite, which is these non-targeting controls that seem to target genes. And that was the example that I gave you. So Sarah Labe, I think while we were doing some sort of manual fact-checking, realized that this could be automated. And so he wrote the Seek and Blast tool. And that was published in 2019. And then last year, we put together a much more detailed protocol as to how to um, verify the results of Seek and Blast on protocols.io. So Seek and Blast, um, you can upload a PDF or an HTML file. It will extract information from that file. It will then take the sequence and do a very simple search using a very old algorithm called BlastN. And we also use Google Scholar to look for sequences in the literature as well. And then we can fact check whether or not the claimed identity of sequences are supported by BLASTN results or not. Our most recent paper was published uh, early this year, and it was covered by Nature when it was a preprint in the middle of last year. So we took Seek and Blast and applied it to more than 11,000 human research papers, and this involved the verification of the identities of yeah, more than 13,000 sequences. And we found 712 papers that had 
one or more wrong sequences, about 1,500 wrong sequences in total. And these papers collectively have been cited 17,000 times, or they had at the time when we wrote this up, uh, which is quite a lot of citations, really. So these are certainly not inert contributions to the literature. They're quite active. Um, most of the fact-checking of the nucleotide sequence reagents was done by Yasunori Park, and this was just a tremendously um, tedious and difficult exercise. So we divided papers into five groups. We looked at the single gene knockdown papers, which were the first type of papers that we studied back in 2017. We chose one MIA. These are very small non-coding RNA genes. In uh, Humans have about 3,000 of these. We just chose one of them. We chose some papers that commonly looked at the effects of two very commonly, chemo commonly used chemotherapeutic drugs, cisplatin and gemcitabine, and then we screened two journals. So you can see for these targeted approaches, we, you know, we, we found quite high proportions of papers with wrong sequences, but we were looking at papers where we kind of expected these kinds of errors to occur, whereas the journal screening was obviously, um, you know, less biased in the sense that we just screened every paper. The most common error was these targeting reagents that just target the wrong gene or wrong sequence. And we saw reasonable proportions of these other sequences that don't seem to target anything. Only the knockdown papers had these non-targeting controls because that's a key feature of this particular knockdown technique. So in some senses, these results sort of made sense um, as much as they can, I guess. Um, most of the incorrect reagents that we found were PCR primers. And again, the pandemic means that probably a lot of people here have probably had one or more PCR tests over the last couple of years. PCR is a little bit like um, playing tennis. Essentially, it relies on two primers and it's a polymerase that goes back and forth between them. So it's a little bit like playing tennis. And uh, if you look to the right, we can see that um, in more than 850 primer pairs, there was something wrong with at least one of the primers. In most of these cases, that meant that no results should have been reported, particularly in cases where we have two primers that don't seem to target anything. Um, I've sort of given the sporting analogy here, you know, where we've got researchers that are claiming that they're playing tennis, but they're actually playing some completely different sport. In terms of what we found from screening the genes, the journal's gene and oncology reports, um, so I've divided the results between 2007 and 2013 and more recent papers for gene. So we screened from 2007 to 2018 for gene, but only 2014 to 18 for oncology reports. It's a much bigger journal that publishes many more papers. You can see that the papers with wrong sequences were infrequent until you know 2013, there weren't many of them. The numbers start to increase. Um, so I should highlight that these percentages are mapped back to all original papers, so not all human research, not all papers with sequences, just everything that was published by the journal. So the highest percentage in gene was a bit over 4%, whereas in oncology reports, we see above 12% in uh, 2015. Most of these papers in oncology reports come from China. Um, in the case of Gene, the majority of the papers also came from China, but there were substantial numbers of papers from other countries. However, between these two journals, we saw a common pattern, and that was where most papers from China with wrong sequences came from hospitals, whereas very few papers from other countries with wrong sequences came from hospitals. So there were certainly papers from other countries, but they overwhelmingly came from medical research institutions or universities, whereas in China, it's, it's hospitals. So there's silly, clearly something quite different happening um, in the gene research literature that's coming from China. So the consequences of these papers, um, essentially they can encourage further research into human diseases because they report positive results. They're likely to impact patient care through opportunity costs, through lost opportunities to do more productive research. They will have more direct impacts upon the gene research community through the pursuit of unproductive gene candidates, overestimation of knowledge and distortion of results from text mining. These are all potentially very wasteful. I essentially stopped doing laboratory research largely because of these papers. Um, I made this slide many years ago when I was still doing this research to try and summarize what we'd done. And when I started to look back on this slide, when I realized you know, what we were studying, I guess I became quite depressed because it, it became apparent to me how difficult it was to actually do this kind of research. So this gene here, MAL2, that we cloned in 2001, 
we eventually identified another gene called imp 2 um, we, we started the work to identify imp 2 almost at the same time as we identified MAL2. Well, at the same time it was published MAL2. It took us nearly 10 years to publish that paper, you know. Um, the lipid storage paper here probably took several years and there's a second lipid storage paper in 2019. We were starting those experiments in 2015 and we published in 2019. So the whole thing is just tremendously slow, difficult, expensive. Why? Why is that? I've given some thought to that. Essentially, laboratory research requires a lot of things. You need money, firstly, and then you need approvals. You often need human research ethics approval to work with human biospecimens. If you're going to use animal models, you need animal ethics. You often need biosafety clearances to work with particular kind of vectors. You have to purchase resources, people, equipment, things. Then you start your experiments. The experiments can take years. That's because you have to set up and optimize each experimental system, conduct experiments with technical replicates, do the whole thing again with biological replicates, look at your data, think about what you're gonna do next and start again. And this goes on and on until you have enough data to write up as a manuscript. Then it goes to peer review. So it is difficult. These experiments are hard. It costs money and it just takes time. And all of these factors mean that this kind of research is tremendously vulnerable to fraud because paper mills don't need to do any of these things. They don't have to get any money. They don't need to obtain regulatory approvals, which can take months or years. They don't have to buy anything. They don't have to do any experiments. Their life really starts here, peer review. So just to sort of expand upon our model, you know, we've got lots of genes. They can be studied in different ways. We can repurpose conserved experimental approaches, particularly across cancer, to study the same gene in different in the same way. And then we have this tremendous time scale and resource differential between genuine versus fraudulent gene research. The advantages of fraudulent research increase with study complexity, which is a pretty scary thing to contemplate. And then we have these dilution factors, many authors, many journals, many years. Peer review may be the rate limiting step for paper mills. For genuine research, it's definitely experiments, but for peer review, it's sorry, for paper mills, it's likely to be peer review. So what's the evidence for that? It's there's evidence that paper mills try to gain peer review in different ways. So both Jana Christoph and myself had witnessed manuscripts that were submitted to multiple journals at the same time. That's a good way of increasing the likelihood of success. Manipulation of peer review has been linked with paper mills through mass retractions. And there have been descriptions of hijacking of journals through editors, either guest editors or through editors being paid. So clearly there's lots of things that publishers can do if the rate limiting step lies with them. And here we need to consider that journals and researchers think about the literature very differently. Journals read manuscripts, researchers read papers. So journals are likely to focus on mechanisms that will prevent the, the publication of paper mill papers in the first place, which is important, but it's not the whole story because, as I said, researchers really only care about what they read in the literature. So we need some new gatekeeping mechanisms. Some of them are not so new. We've proposed compulsory preprinting of gene research. Uh, we did this in 2020. Uh, all it requires is will, essentially. We just have to make it a, a mandatory element of manuscript submission. I think that that would be a very useful approach to reduce a number of um, manuscripts that can be simultaneously submitted to multiple journals. The other thing that we're proposing is re registration of gene research. This is a little more radical. So we propose that all gene research should be registered and this would be done in a very simple way. But the key feature is that once a research team has received a dated authorization to submit a manuscript that it is only valid a year after the date. It cannot be transferred, it cannot be used any earlier, it cannot be used for a different manuscript, and it does not confer manuscript acceptance. So then a year later, the author submit their manuscript with the authorization to submit and off we go. So why would this make a difference? Well, it might move the rate limiting step from paper mills from peer review back to here, and even the playing field somewhat. I think paper mills would really really dislike such a mechanism. Okay, so if we're back to this slide, we need to think it's not enough to prevent manuscripts from being published. Clearly many 
manuscripts have already been published, we have to do something about them. So we have proposed that we need to completely overhaul the, our capacity to correct the literature. At the moment, we have many published errors and virtually no capacity to correct them. And the only group that disadvantages is people that are conducting fraud on an industrial scale. It's very disadvantageous for genuine research. So we urgently need to rescale our error correction capacity and have a system that's actually fit for purpose. So we described our experiences in um, reporting uh, non-coding, sorry, non-targeting nucleotide sequence reagents to journals in 2021. We only talked about the journals that actually responded. So just to remind you, these are these reagents that are not meant to target anything and yet seem to target these two genes. And we found that um, there was one journal that basically took no action and told us that they intended to take no action. These journals were responded in different ways with corrections, expressions of concern, retractions, but most of them were very small. So if we're going to have a scalable system, we've proposed that we need to flag verifiable errors rapidly when they're reported without contacting errors, without contacting authors, and this could be done through an editorial note. So this is an existing mechanism that's underused. So it would only require will, no skill at all. Um, the time for error reporting to publication could be very quick. It would be a placeholder. It would be indexed in PubMed. We would avoid the negative language around expressions of concern. Okay, so for the researchers. Researchers, there's many things that researchers can do to protect themselves from these kinds of papers. But I think one of the things that I'm starting to see is an increasing loss of trust in some areas of the gene research literature. So these are quotes from Twitter. The blue um, bubbles are from people that have identified themselves. The red bubbles are from people that haven't. I think my favorite quote is the one at the bottom about anybody scrolling through PubMed over the last few years must realize that there's a big problem. That is very true. But I'm worried that people are starting to place blanket levels of distrust on particular kinds of research, which will not really, which will not be good. This problem of dislocation between scientific and career value of publications is clearly quite extreme. And it's going to take a lot of effort to come back to the middle of this kind of curve. It will require lots of people working together. I have been very encouraged by the paper mills report that was published very recently by Cope and the STM group. We need skill, we need will, but we need a lot more will than skill. If I had to choose, I would go for will. And we all need to remember that our 40,000 genes, they need to belong to us and, and not to paper mills. So I'm going to stop there and thank the people who have contributed to this work. Um, many people, grateful of course to journal and editors and peer reviewers who always help us as well. This is the website for my group at the University of Sydney. And if you're interested, you're very welcome to get in touch with us. So I'm going to stop there and I'd be very happy to have some discussion. And um, yep, probably, possibly I've got one other slide that's got a summary of um, actions against paper mills that we might talk to as well. But thanks very much for your interest and your attention.